Amount of State Aviaries, and he is the president of Raleigh County Beekeepers Cooperative Association. So, thanks for joining us tonight, Mark, and looking forward to your presentation. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drop that screen down. So, I don't want to spend a lot of time. I'm, I'm really thankful that the WVBA is continuing to do this. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to get information out, uh, especially with all of the constraints that we have throughout the nation, I guess, in the world. So thanks to the WVBA. We want to jump right into this. This is going to be rather lengthy. I will say this. We're going to go over uh, in pretty good detail some queen rearing information and possibly in future meetings, whether spring, fall conferences or whatever, uh, we could have multiple sessions on the same day covering different areas because this is a rather technical subject. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, the basics of queen rearing, the mechanics, the tools, and then the actual process. Uh, we're simply stepping in and manipulating the colony to raise queens when we want them to uh, because we know that they're more than capable of doing that on their own. Um, every time they swarm, they make more queens, right? If you've pulled a frame out and had more than a dozen queen cells uh, on the bottom, you're, you're thinking, wow, uh, what could I do with those cells? And obviously that is one way uh, to raise queens. I certainly wouldn't waste good queen cells if I had the potential to use them. Um, and they also, for other reasons, uh, make a new queen uh, as, the, as the hive dictates. So we know that any fertilized egg will be uh, a worker uh, when that first uh, hatches 24, 36 hours after it hatches, that uh, we could transfer that fertilized egg uh, into a position in a colony that would make it a queen. So the, one of the biggest differences uh, is obviously the diet. Uh, so the, the uh, potential queens are fed a steady diet, a massive diet of royal jelly whereas the workers and the drones get a little bit initially and then their, their food is supplemented uh, with worker jelly that has pollen, honey, uh, smaller amounts of royal lactin, which is a protein, and the queens continue to be fed as they should. Um, queen cells are vertical. They have to be. We're growing uh, a very large cell here, and we'll see that one of the measures if you undertake queen rearing to determine is if you are raising a good sized queen will be the amount of royal jelly that is left over after the process is complete in that queen cup. So you're gonna to want to say, hey, that larva developed had so much royal jelly that it couldn't consume it all and there is still, um, a bed of royal jelly in there and occasionally uh, we'll talk about later that they may go back and consume that. Uh, so we see that some of the scenarios that they're going to raise new queens and that's the swarm impulse. Uh, we probably all experienced that. The conditions get crowded. It's during a flow. We didn't get in in time uh, and the swarm impulse starts and once that swarm impulse starts uh, my opinion, uh, the only way to slow it is to take the original queen out, um, make an artificial swarm with her and a bunch uh, of uh, brood. Otherwise, you're cutting queen cells every seven days and you will eventually miss one or multiples. The emergency replacement of the queen, uh, we've slammed the lid on her when we were a little hurriedly closing the colony and now they have to replace her or supersedure of a failing queen. Could be that uh, age is a factor. She's not producing enough brood. Um, she has perhaps a damaged foot, uh, whatever that the bees see that we often don't see, uh, they are going to make a new queen. 
So when we talk about queen rearing, I think in general, we're talking about early spring, spring and early summer. Um, much easier to raise queens up until uh, the summer solstice and for about 10 days after that than beyond that window. And that's simply because in our area, uh, we generally start into a summer dearth and that, that plays a little havoc when you're trying to raise queens. So, um, and I, again, I'll say this is location uh, oriented. I'm in southeastern Raleigh County, but I'm at an elevation of slightly over 3,000 feet. So the times you may have to adjust by a couple of weeks, depending on your physical location. Uh, so really for us, late April, all of May, all of June, uh, most of July, and then sometimes into August. And August is really sketchy about being able to get a well-mated queen. And that's obviously the goal is well-mated queens. If we have that dearth, there are some measures that you can take to try and extend uh, your queen rearing season with some success, but it may be very limited success. So I think in future meetings, it would be good to talk about other methods. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about the do little method. Um, GM Doolittle pioneered this in the late 1800s. Uh, trying to figure out a way to raise queens. So he made some queen cups, transferred the larva into it, figured out he could raise those over a strong hive with the queen confined to the bottom, put them into a queenless nuke, uh, and then raise them. The advantage of the Doolittle method, and I'm not throwing off, there are a lot of good methods, right? We know you could do cell punch. We know you could do uh, OTS. Uh, we know you could do NICOT. Not, I'm not uh, throwing off on those methods. This is probably the easiest method to make uh, a large number of queens on a very predictable timetable. Uh, you're going to be able to count backwards through the whole process of when you'd like to see mated queens and know when to start. Um, and you should be able to, with some practice, uh, come up with some pretty predictable numbers. Now we were talking about uh, how much food larva gets versus queen larva. And, and this slide I think illustrates that very well. Uh, you can see on the right, those larva are well fed. I can see royal jelly around each one of those cells. So that's not an issue if they're not well fed, but look at the one on the left, the queen cell. Um, it looks like that larva is floating in an ocean of royal jelly. So she is going to have as much pure royal jelly as she can consume um, through the process uh, to make that super healthy queen uh, that we all desire. And that kind of gets us a little bit of a segue into we want to make sure that we get the right aged larva when we graft. That's kind of a big deal for several reasons. Uh, one of those being that after about 36 hours, now this is after the egg falls over and hatches, right? We're talking day four here. It's hatched, it's being touched or fed by nurse bees. Um, we get beyond that 36 hour window, the diet starts to get shifted. So we don't want to have grafted larva that didn't have that fantastic diet uh, the whole time. So we're looking for young larva, right? It's an egg, falls over day four, it, it, it hatches. We have a larva that's being fed. We don't want to graft the earliest larva, we want to wait 24 hours to 36 hours window. And that's just, you gain that by practice, by looking at a lot of frames and a lot of larva. And I'll say this, consistency is the key to this. Um, once you decide in your mind that you've picked up the correct 
sized or aged larva. You want to use that as the pattern throughout the rest of that grafting session because four or five hours difference can mean uh, a lot when it comes to a couple of bars of queen cells. So we're looking at this example. Uh, when I, if I pull this frame out, uh, to be quite honest, I see a couple on there. I'd want to pull some more frames out. I really wouldn't want to be stuck with this frame uh, to graft off of. There are a couple of younger larvae. Some don't have a lot of royal jelly. So when we go to pull out our frame, typically uh, what we like to do is go in uh, three or four days, mark the frames that we see the queen on uh, with a paint stick so that we know graft day, I can go and pull those two or three frames uh, to find the correct age larva rather than just spending an inordinate amount of time pulling frames out brushing bees off, trying to see uh, if you've got the right frame. There are other uh, things you can do. You can make a box so that you're rotating frames on one side of, a, of an excluder uh, to make sure that you're, you're confined one or two frames should have the proper age on there. But we're just talking about early on, we're gonna pull frames. Um, so we can see here, although this is cool, it's not the frame you want to graft off of. I'll say this, this is one mistake to avoid. When you pull the frame out and it's covered in bees, don't shake that frame to get rid of the bees because these small larvae will slide on that pool of royal jelly and then you'll have larvae that's on the very edge uh, of the pool and it'll make it very difficult or, or impossible to get uh, that larva transferred easily. And that is a weird looking photo. Ah, there we go. Now this is extremely magnified. Uh, the ones with the blue arrows uh, would be what I would shoot for if I had a lot of those uh, on that frame. I'd go ahead and set it up. I've seen people do it different ways. We actually have two different ways. We have a thing we can hang over the steering wheel, set our frame on, or we also have your uh, standard, and you'll see it here shortly, the, the grafting jig where you place your frame in there and screw it down. You're able to tilt it to whatever angle you want. Uh, so it's referred to, you're looking for a larva that looks like a comma, uh, not a U, but a comma. And I put that yellow arrow there for a particular reason. I think that larva would be okay to graft. It just doesn't have the same amount of royal jelly if you'll look at the others. The ones with the blue arrows have much more royal jelly, much easier to scoop out a larva that's on a large bed of royal jelly than one that's, that's very small. Uh, hasn't been fed a lot, hasn't been touched a lot by nurse bees. So those three, I think, would be prime candidates. Remember what I'd said, we wanna stay consistent, right? So once I, once I do those, I have to keep in my mind, that's what I wanna look for if I'm running a bar. I think our bars normally are about 15 cells per bar. So if I'm running two bars per frame, I want that 30 uh, to be almost identical so that I don't end up with one that's a day older than the rest, uh, merges the day before I think it should, uh, and kills all the other cells for me. Kind of the same thing in this photo, um, two decent cells there um, that, that have grafting potential. Uh, on this frame, probably if, if I look a little further out, this, this may be very, very near the center. So if I look a little further out, uh, I might find more of the age I want. Time's critical. We're gonna talk about that in just a little bit, but the time that that frame is out of the hive while you're grafting from it needs to be minimal. Uh, these larvae are being touched multiple times. When I say touched, nurse bees going in there uh, and potentially feeding them. 
they're being touched multiple, multiple times uh, every hour. So if you have that thing out for a half hour, that little tiny larva, one, starts to desiccate or dry, and two, isn't getting fed uh, as much as it would have in the hive. So you have to have everything planned out. Uh, ideally, you'd like to be in and out of that hive 15 minutes tops. Pull it out, that's the one I put the paint stick on. Yes, it's good. Brush my bees off of it. Set it in my grafting stand. Pull my larva out. Get my larva back in my starter, which we'll talk about. Then put the main frame back in the hive. Uh, so that kind of gives you a time reference. That does sound a little um, maybe um, scary to start with if you haven't done it. Because I'll tell you this, this is all about practice. Uh, the first time you do this, most likely you're going to say, I can't really see that well. Uh, and then I'm having trouble getting it uh, on whatever tool you choose. And then I'm having trouble getting it off that tool uh, into my cell cup. So don't get frustrated uh, if you go two or three rounds. Uh, and struggle. It, it comes with practice um, and start as early as possible to get as much practice as possible that year. This is a really good frame. So this frame has been shaved uh, so that you can see the larva. Excuse me. So that you can see the larva. Uh, I'd graph just about every one of those unless some of them didn't have enough royal jelly. But every one of those has great potential. They are all almost identical, so I don't have to worry about an age difference. Uh, I see enough here. I could just about run one bar um, without having to move off of these 30 or so cells that's in, in this uh, window. Now, I will say again, and of course Keith can jump in there, if you have any questions about something we're looking at, this is not going to be like some of the other sessions where you should wait to the end. If you have a question on a particular frame or something, I can back up. I think I have about 45 slides. So I know I'm going kind of quickly, but I think it kind of all builds on the process so that you've got a good overview of what you need to do uh, to be successful. Here we can see uh, some more. The ones that are blue, I think, are um, a good grafting size. They are consistent. I will say this, the one in the lower left looks to me like it may be off of the pool of royal jelly a little bit. I'm basing that just off this photo. And uh, obviously, the one on the left with the yellow arrow, you can see that that larva is probably a day older than the others. I don't want that to be on one particular uh, string with other larvae that young. And then the one on the lower right that's yellow definitely uh, is, is usable. Uh, again, I would want to try to be consistent with the size of my larva. Knowing the age of my eyes, uh, the blue ones would be more of what I would be capable of getting out. Looks like they have a large amount of royal jelly in each of those cells. So I think it should be fairly easy to scoop one of those out at a time. Um, when I told you about trying to remain consistent and everybody that's raised queens has one of these pictures, uh, it's not something you're particularly proud of, but it occurs, and what happened is that there was one larva that was a day, maybe two days older than the rest when they were grafted. It emerged in the cell finisher and systematically uh, stung each of the other uh, pupa that were developing. So you have one victorious queen, and it really, really makes for a bad day when you pull that out, or even worse, if there was two bars 
that you grafted on that frame and they're all chewed out except for one. So now I'm trying to find the one queen to at least say I've salvaged something. Um, very good chance she may have squeezed through um, the excluder on my finisher and she's down where my uh, mated queen is and I still will only have one queen. So just to show you, uh, and you know, I'll say this, I'm probably not near as good as some of these other uh, queen producers or folks that rear queens, but I'll normally in a season have one of those. Um, you get in a hurry, uh, you're running late, the weather's coming in, whatever, you get a little sloppy with what you're doing, you're trying to get finished. And that really tends to anchor you for the rest of the season. So if I'm gonna have that happen, I'd prefer that happen rather soon in the season to kind of get my head screwed on right. So what's the difference between rearing queens and breeding queens? I mean, the result is queens, right? But rearing queens, you're just kind of duplicating something uh, in a colony. Uh, you're not trying to control any of the characteristics uh, of the line that you're breeding. You're just trying to make more queens. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to sell queens on much of a scale, uh, you're going to want to be able to tell your customers that, look, they were bred from this line to exhibit these characteristics as much as you're able to uh, with an insect that is open mated. Um, obviously, the first trait we select for is survivors, right? If the queen died over winter, she probably isn't eligible for our rearing program that spring. And oftentimes, if you don't have a lot of colonies to select from, that may be your only option. You're simply um, breeding from survivors. Not to say that's bad, but you would like to know that you have some other characteristics that you've at least attempted uh, to single out. So the breeder uh, tries to run lines uh, to provide you with consistent queens so that if you get 10 queens, you kind of expect those colonies to all behave similarly. Uh, that can involve either that breeder instrumentally inseminating the queen that he's using in his program, or he's purchased a breeder queen that someone else has instrumentally inseminated. Uh, and that's another skill set in itself. Um, we have some guys in the state and around us that are good at that. Uh, I don't do that. Uh, I will pay uh, for an instrumentally inseminated queen that is of quality uh, so that I'm that far into the breeding process. And here's where if you're not real careful, you've gone this far, you've bought 300 a 500 dollar whatever a thousand dollar instrumentally inseminated queen that's going to be the focus of your program and then you don't control the drone yards around your mating yard you've lost a lot of the potential you have to be able to try to saturate the area around your mating yard uh, with drone mothers, queens, uh, specifically that you also are hoping you get the characteristics from in your program. Now, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. It gets a little technical, so we'll just say this. We're always told that spotty brood patterns are the result of a failing queen, uh, EFB, uh, a, a lot of other issues. We know that uh, the workers and queens are diploid and that drones are haploid. However, there is something that's known as a diploid drone. So that's where someone got a little uh, lax in keeping records. Uh, they've got queen mothers over their drone yards spaced away from their main mating yard uh, that are too closely related to the queens that they're getting mated. So, those um, 
larva are being eaten. We don't know it. The, the, the nurse bees understand that, hey, this is a diploid drone. Can't have that. We're going to consume that. We're going to get that out of the colony. So you could get a spotty brood pattern in your queen rearing from the fact uh, that you and everyone you've known ordered queens in the same shipment from the same supplier, and that's what you saturated the area with. A little easier to explain if we had an actual class and we could set some colored cups up. But we, we want to avoid that, so you want different genetics in your drone yards versus your home mating yard, where your mating nukes are gonna be set up. Um, how far should those be set up? That's, that's a good question in and of itself, maybe a quarter to a half mile. I wouldn't think you'd want to get much farther than that. There's been some information on it. It's a lot of old information. Uh, I know Jason uh, Bragg uh, has done some work with, with a mechanical drone uh, to try and locate uh, the drone congregation areas. But a lot of that is, is fairly new, uncharted territory. I've spoke to Debbie Delaney at the University of Delaware and Rick Fell from Virginia Tech. There's just not a lot of hard answers to say your drone yards should be between a quarter and three eighths of a mile, and you should have three uh, on a triangular pattern. So the idea is as much as you're able to, uh, to saturate the area. I think in our program, our mating yard is encircled by five other yards of different stock uh, to try and get well-mated queens. Here's the $64,000 question, and if anyone can answer it, uh, we need you to work for us. When should I start rearing queens? Well, there's the textbook answer, and then there's the real world answer. So the textbook answer says, well, when the drones are in the purple eye stage. Uh, so you pull out frames, you pick off uh, the drone cappings until you see that pupa starting to develop purple eyes. That's telling you that the drones in that age uh, should be sexually mature flying by the time you could graft queens. They emerge and take their mating flights. That's, that's great information. In West Virginia, um, I don't really worry about that. I have drones in the purple eye stage weeks before I'm ever able to graft. Um, temperature and weather here is much more the predictor. I guess the farther south you go, uh, that would be closer to accurate for the purple eye stage. Uh, maybe why some of the southern queen producers don't have real successful early runs on queens as they're trying to jump the gun, which I understand they're, they're doing that for a living. But for us, I'm, I'm going to wait until I have decent weather in a 10-day forecast. We, uh, in the spring of 2020, lost one full round of queens, around 120 queens, in the middle of May, when we should have been able to uh, do that without any any concerns and we had two nights that it was below 25 degrees so we had a lot of mortality uh, in our uh, mating nukes and uh, got very few we were less than 20 percent uh, successfully mated queens and we had a lot of rain in may so so until we got out of may uh, our successfully mated queens that we knew were good producers we didn't have as many. So when the weather clears, that's a good time. Um, this graphic is just basically telling you need as many drones as possible. Uh, we know that uh, that uh, mating flight is going to involve 12, 15, whatever the number is of drones with our queen. But that drone congregation area is going to be super saturated with drones uh, looking to mate. So we can up our chances of better mated queens uh, if in our drone mating yards, those yards that we've put around our 
mating yard for our queens, uh, we throw some drone foundation, drone comb in. And they, that's made in both uh, medium and deep frames. They're the green plastic. That green is, is your indicator that that's drone frames. Uh, you want to put those in early. We normally try to add those in uh, late March. We want them to be in the colony well before they could get used. And then we go in and start checking in April uh, to see if the days are warm enough to see are we getting a lot of uh, uh, larva in those drone frames so we can kind of predict when we are we have the saturation we want. Uh, so the capability is a lot of drones. Most drones are going to live their life out and die of starvation uh, rather than mating. And that's unfortunately, uh, if we're making queens, we want that scenario. I want there to be so many drones that I don't have to worry about is there enough for me to have successfully had my queens mated well. Uh, one thing you have to worry about when you do that, you are now a professional mite farmer. So uh, you are encouraging mites uh, because we know that their preferred host uh, are drone larvae. So when we do this, we're going to have to go in, check, do mite washers more often, and treat those colonies more often so that they don't collapse on us later on. If, you, if you're thinking about starting queen rearing, uh, two things jump out, I think, that is often overlooked. Everybody gets uh, excited about what method and how they transfer it. Your two big things are going to be the number of support colonies you need to run that operation, and then the sheer volume of mating nukes and brood frames that you're going to have to have. It takes a lot. So if you know you want to raise 100 queens, we'll look a little later at the math, uh, at the number of hives you're going to have to have to support that. Uh, we're going to have to consider supplemental feed, not always, but you have to remember if you've got an inordinate proportion of drones than normal, uh, you may have to supplemental feed those colonies, especially in, uh, in areas when the flow is not the strongest. Then we want to pull those frames out. Uh, or at least check to make sure they've already started to backfill it uh, so that we don't have a lot of, of uh, drone in there when we don't need them. I don't think that's normally a problem, but we want to be able to bring the mite population under control early enough uh, in the summer so that our queen uh, and the colony is healthy and has a huge winter bee uh, population. So, Again, we're going to talk tonight about grafting the Doolittle method. So we're going to use a tool. Uh, we'll look at those here in just a second. And we're going to slip that tool under the correct aged larva without damaging it, pick it up and transfer it to a queen cell cup uh, onto a frame. Um, and that will go into our starter. Um, Something that you're going to learn early on, it's kind of a one and done. So you have one shot at getting that larva out of there. You can't go in and just continue to dig. That larva has to stay in the same orientation. So if it's a backwards facing C or comma or a front facing, you have to make sure that through the process it stays that way uh, and that when you put it into your cup, and slide it off, it still remains in that orientation. If you flip it over, uh, it's going to drown in the, in the uh, royal jelly, so it's not going to be successful. And if it's more than one try, you're probably going to damage that larva, and it's still not going to be accepted. Uh, the other thing is um, you need to keep a damp towel, paper towel, something to cover over 
uh, the queen cups that you've just deposited your larva in so that they don't dry out because you've taken them out of their original location. You've probably lost some royal jelly from that location over into the cup that you just transferred it. So you want to keep it as moist as possible. They desiccate or they dry out quickly. We're gonna look at some of the tools. Uh, this is a German grafting needle. Everybody has their preference. Um, Sean Phelps is our, our queen grafter at uh, Appalachian Beekeeping Collective. He prefers German grafting needle and he'll use one of those two ends to scoop it out and deposit it. Um, these are all available uh, from your bee supply places. This probably runs $15 or so. Uh, this is a JZ BZ tool. It's a plastic handle, has a pointed plastic hook on it. Uh, and, and of course, if you're familiar with the JZ BZ line, that's also the little plastic cups. Uh, if you're doing the do little grafting that you're probably going to be grafting into. Uh, about $4. Um, I never could get the hang of it. I had to twist it too many different ways. And this is a Chinese grafting tool. So at the end of class, we're going to have a test. It's one question. The question is going to be, where does a Chinese grafting tool come from? And uh, hopefully you get that part right. These are cheap. Um, this one with the bamboo on it probably runs about $3. If you can get those, I like those a little better than the ones with plastic. They seem to be a little better quality, but sometimes it's hard to get those. Um, I normally buy 20 or 30 at a time and sort through them uh, early on and invariably um, discard about half of them. Then I'll tell you a little bit later what to do with the rest. You're gonna to have to have some magnification unless you're 14 years old and your eyes are perfect. And, and if you are, you have the potential of a long storied career in queen grafting. Uh, the rest of us struggle to see. Uh, so here's two things. Um, the magnifier that's lighted on an arm and that's a fluorescent light and you can see the different colors. I turned them both on in the right. On, and in the lower left, uh, is a magnifier that you place around your head. The case comes, I think, with five different magnification um, glasses on it, so you decide which one helps you to see the larva the best. I'll say this, depth perception, the more magnification you have, the worse your depth perception. So you may put the, the thickest one on and think, wow, that's great, it jumps out at me. And then when you try and scoop it up, you realize you're, you're above it or you're, just, you're trying to punch below it. So the least amount of magnification you can get just to be able to see. And the difference in the color is the two lights. The warm yellow on the fluorescent or that lower left is an LED. And that's kind of a really bright white light. Uh, I've used them both. If it's a fairly dark room, I'm going to go with the big lighted circle. If there's decent, uh, ambient light, I'm going to use the little head strap just because I don't have to worry about trying to keep adjusting it out of my way. So here's kind of the toolbox that we use. Um, it's not a fishing tackle box. This is a Stanley toolbox for who knows what. Um, so you can see that was one order of Chinese uh, grafting pins. Uh, on the left, side you'll see two grafting pins in one compartment. Those two I took out, I worked them, I liked the way the spring worked, I thought well, everything feels good and sometimes there's a there's a little plastic tongue you'll see in a minute which try and slide under there. Uh, I've got a 6,000 grit uh, sharpening stone and I'll hit that three or four times that little tongue on that stone until it is super nimble so that as I push it down in the cell, uh, it just folds up under the larva. We'll see that in a minute. And then the rest are spares. And I always have 
the other two grafting tools in there. I mean, occasionally I'll try one just to see if I've changed my mind uh, about which one I like the best. But I guess it's what you learn on uh, and what you feel confident with. And for me, it's that Chinese grafting tool. So we, we've got our tools ready. We now have to do some work prior to grafting. We're gonna to have to have a starter colony or a cell starter or just a starter. It's all the same. So a day or so before you graft, you're going to take a colony, make it queenless. You're gonna make certain it's queenless because you're gonna shake every frame off in that colony and make sure there's not a cell starter that you don't know about after you've removed that queen. You're gonna push it down into one box. So you're basically gonna have maybe taken two brood boxes and crammed them into one. And you now have bees flowing out of the front. Uh, they're everywhere. They're overcrowded. And that's exactly what you want. You want sealed brood here. You want some food, uh, pollen. You don't want open larva because as soon as you shut that up, they're going to start building cells again. Um, and then they're just going to start cells. They still may, they still may work on the queen cells that you introduce, but you're wanting to make sure that this colony, this starter is in panic mode, that they are queenless. There's nothing in this hive that we can use to make a queen. And then the voila moment, right? Oh, Mr. Beekeeper, he just dropped in a frame and they're perfect aged. We'll start right on that. Uh, so the starter, uh, we're gonna feed it the day before we want them to be able to draw wax. So this is one-to-one -one sugar syrup. We want them to have an ample amount of wax available so they can start accepting and drawing those queen cells. If you use a closed, and I'll show you a photo in a moment, if you lose, use a closed starter, you're also gonna to have to put a sponge with some water in there because this thing's overcrowded. These bees will overheat if they're not able to fly in and out. So uh, that's, that's uh, one of the other things you have to worry about, what kind of starter you're using. So at home in uh, Mountain State Apiaries Park, I use a five frame starter, this photo of it. I use that as my starter. Um, and I can run 30, I can run two bars, I can run 30 uh, queen cells in that without any trouble. So I'm, I can rotate that disc that you see on the left photo shut. I have a bowl with water and a big sponge on it in the bottom. So that's just extra space below that. That's screened in for them. I've overcrowded them. I've shook extra bees in there. Um, and, and that's my monster starter. And that's a look at it on the right from overhead. It doesn't look that crowded, it, it is in this box, a lot of those are in that bottom. Uh, and then of course, I've got a way if I need to on that lid uh, to feed them, uh, but I will feed them the day prior inside the hive. I always like to take my, my frame that I'm gonna graft on on graft day and drop it in a day or two before, just so the bees can kind of work on it, clean it up, put a little propolis on it so that it smells like home. So now we come to grafting day. Now this is a photo from the Raleigh County Beekeepers Group where we have our, our uh, queen rearing class. So it's uh, um, some information that we send via email for them to study. And on a Friday evening, we have a classroom session with PowerPoint and then Saturday uh, at the school's uh, bee yard at uh, the school farm, we'll take 10 participants uh, and allow them to actually graft and then we help them. So you can see here, they've got their grafting stations. Young man on the right uh, is one of those perfect age individuals. He also had the most cells accepted. He's grafting into that. Uh, you want that room to be uncomfortably warm. So some of the problems that you encounter when you're grafting queens, 
uh, you can pretty well figure out what they are. The frames get left out too long. So um, there's a potential for the larva to desiccate or to dry down a little bit. Uh, so the idea is to really quickly get that in. So we pull the frames for them. We go the day before, mark the ones we want and go out, brush the bees off, hand it to them, let them graft and put it right back in the colonies. So you want it warm. This is normally around the second Saturday in May. We set up an electric heater. So uh, it's pretty uncomfortable for us in there, uh, but it's a great temperature to graft in. And then you, we're gonna have paper towels. You may have saw, let's see if I can go back. Yeah, I see a, a one roll of paper towels there and we have some water bottles that they can continue to use. Um, cover each cell and just continue to pull it over on that bar. So the young man on the right has a cell bar. There are red and green Jay-Z, BZ queen cups that he's got there that he's putting uh, a larva into each one of them. I think it's just before they started. I didn't want to be taking their picture while they was actually doing it because it's stressful enough as the way it was. So here's the idea with the Chinese grafting tool. Here you see Step one, you don't, you don't push the plunger down, right? You're literally just holding it like an ink pen, pushing it down under the larva. You can see in step two that that plastic or nylon tongue has slid under the larva and the royal jelly, and then you pull it out. And hopefully you have the larva on there. Um, and if you don't, you go to the next cell. Then you take it to step four, which is your grafting bar where your cup is. You put it in and now you push the plunger, the handle, the ink pen top, if you will. You push it down and you wash it, push the larva into the bottom of your cup. And remember, we wanna make sure that the orientation of that larva stays the same. We don't wanna flip it 180 degrees or we'll lose it. And you're going to have some that when you're pulling it up, they stick on the side of the cell wall. Move on to the next one. Um, might be a bad habit. I normally stick the end of that tool in my mouth. Uh, hey, what does it taste like? What's the classic answer? Uh, it tastes like chicken. Um, so after we graft, we put it into our cell starter, right? That's our queenless, crowded box that we have fed one-to-one -one syrup to that are anxiously awaiting the possibility to raise queens. We put them in there 24 hours eight later, 48 hours in that range. We can pull that out and that's what we're gonna see. Everything you see that has that white wax cone coming down on it has been accepted. That tells us that they think or, or know that that should make a queen and they've continued to feed it and they're starting uh, the process of making uh, that queen cell. Mm -hmm. So after that period, we're gonna put it into a finisher and that's simply a really strong queen right colony. So we've ahead of time prepped that colony we have found our queen and we put her in the bottom box. We want a couple of open frames of drawn combs so she can lay, cause she's gonna be in there a while. We're gonna put that in the bottom, put our excluder down. And above that, we want to put some open brood, at least two or three frames of open brood in the very middle. And we're, uh, when we take that frame of accepted cells out, we're gonna slide that between two of those frames uh, of open brood. So while they're caring for that brood, they're also caring for and finishing the queen cells for us. Uh, you wanna check that if you do more than one run of queens, if you do multiple runs, in between each of those, you have to go check, make sure your queen's still in the bottom, she hasn't thrown any cells, so that a virgin emerges when you don't know about it and comes up 
and wipes out all your uh, queen cells that are in the finisher. Um, this is like day three from the graph. It's not quite capped, right? It's almost capped. Now, if you look on the very left of that photo, there's a cell that was not accepted. You can see a little bit of wax. They just started a ring around it, and then they realized that something's wrong with that larva. Maybe it was injured in the transfer process. They didn't accept that one. These others have been accepted, and they're finishing drawing it out. The arrow's pointing to the royal jelly that remains in that cup. That cup is completely full of royal jelly. And that's how we're going to know when we get to the end and we pull this thing out and we see that our queen's emerged. We look down in there and we see a little remnant of royal jelly. And it's like, great. She had more than enough. If you let them come out in an incubator, sometimes they'll go back in and eat that. So we use both. We'll let them finish. So when you're grafting, conversation is from the graft date. From the graft date on day 10, so that would mean that it's 14 days old, right? Four days before we grafted it, 10 days after. On day 10, uh, we're going to need to get that into our mating nuke, unless we want to let them emerge in the incubator. So in the incubator, they're going in about day seven to eight. Now that day is from being laid. So as soon as that queen cell is capped, I put it over into an incubator. Um, you can tell where I got it, right? University of Virginia, it was surplus. It had a rotating something in the middle that didn't work. This thing cost about four grand. It went on a surplus sale for uh, a little over $20 taking a pot shot, I knew that it would turn on, that was about it, but it works. You're able to set the bottom numbers is Celsius in tenths of a degree, and the top number is interior temperature, so it'll hold it within a tenth of a degree accurate. 33.3 .3 is like 92. The rotator doesn't work, but I don't need it. Oh, and also on that, you'll see on the top of that I have a whiteboard. I can make notes on like what day uh, put it in when I need to check it or when I checked it and they weren't emerged or so many emerged on a certain day. So this is the inside of it. This, this is um, some that was left over. So some of them I had taken out uh, four or five hours earlier. I went back in. It's like, oh, I ought to take a picture of that. I can put about 20 in that level. I can put a rack in and put other 20 or 30. So I've got the capability in this little incubator to run about 40 or 50. Uh, the humidity is a little low there. It drops really quickly when the doors open, but you see the temperature is dead on at 92. And the bowl with the sponge, that's to provide humidity. If you're going to continue to graft, right, I want to do this again and again. I'm going to get rich. <laughs> Whatever the reason, you're going to do consecutive rounds. You have to replenish your starter because those nurse bees are only going to produce a maximum amount of royal jelly for just a few days in their life. So if you've already been 10 days or so um, before you make your next round, you need to put some more nurse bees in there. Whether it's frames or you shake them in there, you need to replenish those nurse bees. Uh, after the queens are mated, you want to make sure that they have a good laying pattern. You don't want to put queens that are untested. Uh, oh, she's laid 40 eggs. Great, I'll go ahead and use her. You really should let her be in there at least two weeks. I would think that's the minimum, two weeks. Then I can observe the pattern. She's laying good. Okay, I got a decent pattern. Um, and then at that point, I can remove them. I can put them in the queen bank, right? I have to store them. If I'm going to sell these, I have to have some way to store them before I sell them. Queen bank is the way I do that. Um, it's, it's just like the finisher. It's a queen right colony. Queens can, is under uh, an excluder. Was there a question there? Okay, so there's queens under the excluder. And I'm putting her up in the top, my frame, and you'll see what the frame looks like with my caged queens. And they'll go up and feed her take care of them. That's not a problem. 
if you've got a candy end in there, you have to tape over that because if you don't, they'll go in there and just eat all the candy out. And then you're going to have to set up mating nukes. So now we're starting to talk about the amount of resources you need. Um, these are going to be queenless boxes. There are bunches of them. This is temp queen that you can use. If you use the really mini mating nukes, you may have to stick some of these in to hold them until you put your queen cells in. This is what it looks like if you put it inside a cage. We don't normally do that. That's just extra money. We have some of those if our box is fitting tight. Normally, you just push the size side of the queen cell and the cup into the wax in the middle. Here's just some of the wooden mating nukes. Man, it's, it's, it's as broad as your imagination. On the right is a, is a three-way, right? You put two or three frames in there. I guess three frames make three queens. On the left, uh, the middle's divided, so it's a T. That's four-way. I think better B sells that one. Bottom, we've made, bottom uh, on the left here, we've made some three frames. We actually like the three framer pretty good. Uh, that way, if we're a week or so before we can get back, we don't have to worry about uh, our queens swarming on us. If you use these ones on the right, we have some of those too. You have to stay on top of those. Queen can fill those and, and they put some honey and stuff in there. And it's horrible when your, your newly mated queen swarms on you because you didn't check often enough. Resource hives, we're about to the end here. Uh, you'll need to have enough hives to remove brood from to stock all these mating nukes. So if you run 20 three frame mating nukes, you're gonna to have to pull at least 40 frames of brood out. Uh, and then you're gonna have some blank frames put in there to let them work on. Or if you use five frame mating nukes, you're gonna to have to have 80 or more. So resources is very crucial. You need to figure out how many hives, you, uh, how many mated queens you want and work backwards. Check here, you should have a laying queen from eight to 24 days after you've put that cell in. If you don't and you find the queen, you're probably good to go ahead and pinch her. Very little chance that she'll be well mated after 24 days. Um, leave them in there for a couple of weeks so that you can check on them, bank them as you need them. Here's what we use for a frame to hold queen banks. Now these are wooden cages there's a queen in each one of those, and that's just a medium frame with paint sticks ripped in half and little finishing nails on there. And you can see we slide it in the middle, uh, and they'll feed those there until we pull them out and need them. Uh, so uh, that is the way you bank them. You don't want to bank them more than about three weeks because it's detrimental to the queen. Uh, she's never going to be as productive if you keep her in there for six weeks and then let her back out and start laying. Um, sorry that this took so long, but it, that's, I wouldn't believe the amount of slides I deleted just to try and get it to here. I'm here, if there's any, any issues, I'll answer questions as long as you have questions. Good enough, it's been here to go, so. Well, you had a so informative, thank you. I got a question though. So can you tell us how many hives you guys are running per apiary? Uh, in the queen rearing part, uh, ABC, we'll have probably in our queen mating yard, we'll have five or six full-size colonies. Now, that's our queens, the lines that we're um, grafting from. And in that same yard is also our mating yard around the outside of it. And we'll, we'll have probably about 100 mating nukes set up there. Our drone yards will have a couple of hundred total in those five other yards to support them. And then we have another hundred hives in some other locations that we can pull frame from if we're running out of, out of uh, brood. But now that's to get large numbers, right? I mean, you're talking about, oh, I wanna raise four or 500. That takes a lot of numbers. If you're wanting to raise 20 queens, you could probably do that with, I don't know, 10, 10 or 15 strong hives. The problem is you're gonna to need to take brood out at the same time. So later in the summer, it's always easy to get the numbers. In the spring, it's a little tough to come up with the, all the brood you need. There's a question from David. Let's see if I can see, I can see some of the questions here. 
Did you see the do you prime cups from David? Okay, do you prime cups? So priming a cup is some type of liquid that you would put into you the, the cup you're going to use. Uh, we have tried it. You can, as you find rogue queen cells, you can harvest that royal jelly, put it into a little glass tube, and mix it 50-50 with distilled water and put it in a refrigerator, let it warm up on your day, put a drop or so in the bottom of your cups. To be quite honest, uh, and this is just my opinion, and you know what that's worth, um, we tried it. It takes so much extra time. Really didn't see any difference measurable to equal the offset of the work it took to try and prime the cups. They're going to clean that out. That basically, when you're priming the cup, the reason you do that is to make it easier for you to get the larva off your grafting tool into that queen cup. Do you guys breed for any traits, like DSH or anything? We do. We we are, and we're early on. I guess that's the other thing. You can't go from like zero to sixty uh, very quickly. So this is our second year in our breeding program. Uh, so we're breeding uh, for obviously overwintering. Uh, for us, since we're getting these bees out to new individuals that we call partners, we want to make sure they're they're not aggressive. Everybody's definition of aggressive is different. I like bees that are a little spicy. Uh, they seem to do better in a lot of areas, but um, our other is mite counts. So we do mite washes, but then we also do what's called a mite assay, where we'll take a frame of capped brood, put it under one of those magnifying lights or the thing on your head, and you literally pick out uh, 300 larvae, you pull them out with tweezers, lay them down. You're looking for mites. Look down in the cell for mites, and you count. So then we're trying to stay with queens that have the lowest counts. Can you count mites that, and be able to tell ones that are breeding and not breeding? Um, I can't because my eyes aren't that good. I'm not going to lie to you now. <laughs> Sean, uh, who just turned 30, uh, can, can tell whether this is, is uh, mature or not mature. Obviously, I can see the mature mites. But I think the, the takeaway there is it's pretty easy to recognize colonies uh, that have that um, VSH characteristic. Uh, we have one not at work, but within our own personal uh, queen rearing uh, that hasn't been treated. Uh, we're in our second year. Our last assay had one mite in 300. Uh, and we'd, we'd noticed that. So as soon as we do the assay, then we go back and follow it up with a wash to see is, is it comparable, right? The alcohol wash. Alcohol wash showed no mites. The assay showed one. And th they're fairly consistent. So uh, the average beekeeper wouldn't need to get as involved as doing an assay, but if you're going to try and control things like VSH, uh, that's one way to do it. And the percentages I see here, like when you prime cups, the lower percentages, man, I'll tell you what, I think the first half of the first year that I tried to graft, I was lucky if there would be two accepted in, in 15. Um, and a lot of it was I wasn't going fast enough that, or I was damaging the larva. At the point I got uh, some magnification that helped and, and forgot about, ooh, I stuck the pin down on that side. Mm, that one's gone. I'll start another one. Uh, instead of trying to like, oh, gosh, I'm going to go back in and try and make sure I get that larva. I hate to waste the larva. You got to move fairly quickly through the process. And I think your, your success rate will come up. Priming may or may not have any benefit for you. We've got some uh, really good queen breeders and rearers here in West Virginia, Ohio, we've, Kentucky. Uh, they work together uh, to try to uh, bring us the best products. Uh, so I'll plug for them, you know, hey, if you can buy local, uh, I know 
that the queens that we produce at 3,000 feet are very well acclimated here. I've got one, hopefully, knock on wood, uh, getting ready to go into her second winter. Um, locally raised queens uh, do well in the locale that they come from. So support those local ones. There, we've got good ones all over West Virginia, Ohio, parts of Indiana, the Kentucky group. Uh, they work work uh, independently, but share a lot of information and training. That was a question up there too. All right, let me turn you spell the word that means your might check with the larva. Assay, I think it's A-S-S-A-Y, assay. Uh, it's where you try to, uh, it's, it's used a lot in, in metal composition, but in anything where you're trying to get a, a concise number. Um, and, and it's, you really get tired of looking at larva pulled out on, on tweezers. Uh, normally, I can only do one a day, and then maybe I'll have somebody else do one because I, I'm ready to, to jump out the window at the point I've pulled 300 of those out and looked at them. And I will, if anybody's interested, um, I'll give you two emails. If you want to see photos of the assay, I, I've got some photos we used at work before and after. I'd be glad to share with you. So two emails. One is WVBGuy, right? W-V-B-E-E-G-U-Y at Yahoo. Or uh, mlilly at app, A-P-P, headwaters, H-E-A-D-W-A-T-E-R-S dot org. So App Headwaters is Appalachian Beekeeping Collective. That's my day job. And then WVB Guy is my evening job. So I have a very boring life. It's B seven days a week. All right. Well, if nobody has any more questions, thank you very much. That was great. So. You guys all have a wonderful evening. All right. Thanks, everyone.